Hi everybody, thanks for coming along. Um, my name is Tor Mitchell and today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about product management. So before we get stuck in, just a, a little bit about um, me. Uh, so I originally studied physics a long time ago um, and while I was uh, while I was at university, I got a summer job in my hometown of Bournemouth uh, at a small internet company that just started up. It was literally one of these tiny little provincial internet companies that were a bit of a thing in 1995. And um, quickly realised that this internet stuff seemed quite interesting and probably more interesting than physics. So uh, when I graduated, I got a job at a company called Sun Microsystems. And they were a big player in the internet infrastructure back in the late 90s. Um, was there for about eight years. Spent some time with them in the US, rode the dot-com boom up, rode the dot-com boom, collapsed down, um, and then moved to Google in 2006, uh, and spent another uh, nine years at Google. Um, and while I was at Google, I moved from more of an engineering role into more of a product role, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, and I spent time at Google both in London and also quite a bit of time in Sydney and in San Francisco. And then uh, about a year ago, moved back home, as it were, back to the UK, um, to join Crowdcube, who are a, a small company based up on the Innovation Centre here at the University. So, why am I here? Um, one of the first things I, I was asked to do when I started Crowdcube was to build a product team. In other words, hire a bunch of people. Um, and my plan was to hire a few experienced product managers and a few, or one or two maybe, uh, sort of graduates or people who were interested in product management. And I thought it would be easy find graduates and hard to find experienced people and I was completely wrong. It was the complete opposite. Um, it was it proved surprisingly difficult to find graduates who might be interested in these roles because it turns out nobody understands what this role is. Nobody's ever heard of it, nobody knows why they might want to do it. And that seemed like a real shame to me because it's actually very fundamental to kind of modern technology companies. It's actually a really interesting and fun role, especially if you've kind of got aspirations to perhaps start your own business one day um, or uh, sort of take a leadership position. Okay, so um, what I decided to do, uh, essentially this, this presentation, is my attempt to fix that. This is not actually a hiring presentation. We did eventually manage to fill these positions. Uh, we're not actually hiring right now. But it worried me so much that graduates didn't have a good sense of what product management is and why they might want to consider it as a career option. That the least I could do was try and help them. Um, so this is the first time I've given this presentation. So it's as bad as it's ever going to be. So bear with me. Um, but hopefully by the end of it, you'll get a sense of what this role is and why it might be interesting to you. And then hopefully uh, there'll be more opportunities for me to do this to other groups of students in the future. So what are we going to cover? So three things. What is a product manager? What on earth, what on earth am I talking about? Um, is this a role that might be good for you? Uh, and then if it is, how would you actually go about becoming one? Um, I should stress actually that also, even if you decide by point two that this is not a role for you, want nothing to do with this, it sounds awful. Uh, you may well end up working with product managers at some point in your career, so it might be good for you to know what you're up against. Okay, so what is a product manager? So first you start with something fundamental, what is a product? When we talk about products, we talk about product managers. Product, any physical goods, software or service offered to consumers or businesses. So very broad definition, it could be camera, it could be a bottle of water, it could be an app on your phone, it could be a plumber, it could be, um, you know, Fairground. And essentially, in one word, in one phrase, a product, what the product manager's job is to do is to own the success of that product. Figure out what it would take for that product to succeed. So how do you go about doing that as a product manager? Well, the first thing you, you have to understand is what success looks like. Why does this product exist? What is it trying to achieve? Um, and only then can you figure out kind of what the metrics are by which you measure its success and then try and um, move those. So to do that, you kind of step right back and say, well, what's the goal of this product? What is the vision for it? What is it? Um, what is its potential? What could it be in a few years' time if we really try to make it a success? And so you start a vision, and then you start working your way down through kind of the different steps as you work your way towards actually doing something. So once you've got a vision, then you need a strategy. <coughs> How are we going to get from where we are to where we want to be with this product? Uh, and how will it deliver value to the business? Obviously, products have to pay for themselves as they're being developed. Okay, so you've got a strategy, and that will kind of inform a roadmap, like a, a path from where you are to where you want to be, which is a sequence of milestones, you know, releases, whatever you want to call them. And each of those has to have uh, a set of requirements that it's trying to address. 
And the thing about requirements gathering is it's really an exercise in listening. Right? You need to listen to your customers, you need to listen to your users or your potential customers, understand what is it they need, what are their pain points, what are they struggling with, why um, uh, are they using your product and how can you help them? Because often your expectations as to what your product is, is for or how it's used are completely different from the, from the thing that draws, draws your users in. Okay, so once you've got your requirements, then you compile those together and you create what we call user stories. And user story is a fancy way of saying a feature, essentially some incremental improvement in the product. We call them user stories because we try and separate ourselves as product managers from the implementation. We don't dictate to the engineering team or the design team how something is built. What we say is, these are the user behaviors we need to facilitate. So, for example, um, if you were building uh, a, uh, a system for um, a railway ticketing, you might say, um, a user story might be, as a passenger, I want to be able to carry my ticket on my phone. And that's it. That's, that's the whole story. Um, and then it's up to the design team and the engineering team who you hand these things off to, to actually figure out how to make that happen. So as a product manager, you own this whole tree. Right? Your job is to understand fundamentally what the goal of your product is, to have a sense of where it's going, of, of, of what it could be, evangelize that to people, get people excited about it, get them on board, um, get them willing to help you, because you're going to need a lot of help. Um, and then go from there all the way down to the nitty gritty of what we're doing tomorrow. What are we going to build? So once you've handed it off, the job's not over. Um, because you're still the maker of trivial decisions. And what I mean by this is when you actually get stuck into developing a product, or any kind of product, what you tend to find is that no matter how good you are at that requirements gathering stage, there's always lots of little questions that bubble up all the way along. What should the label on this button be? What should the, the help text on this talk tip be? Should we go for red? Should we go for green? Like silly little things. But little things which, if nobody feels empowered to do them or decide them, will just paralyze your development. So someone has to just step up and say, I'm going to decide, I'm going to do it that way. Um, and sometimes you've got data, which is great. Like sometimes you've got some, you've got sort of a way of actually testing different variations, where you've got uh, some evidence from previous experience that doing it one way is better than the other. But often it's just like either of these solutions is a perfectly good one. Someone just has to decide. Uh, you're also I can I couldn't uh, resist this terrible pun. Um, you're also uh, the uh, kind of you're the one person who really deeply cares about how good this thing is, like, wants it to be great, wants it to feel polished, wants it to feel really refined, wants it to make people happy. And so you're the person who has to really focus on the details, right? You have to say, as you know, I don't think that works quite as well as it could, or I don't think that looks quite as good as it could, and hold the teams to account and push them to actually deliver something really, really great. And then, once you're at the point where you're almost ready, you've got to coordinate the launch of the things. You've got to get the thing out the door. Um, and that could mean a million and one different things, right? So it depends again on the product, but you might have documentation that someone needs to write, you have to make sure that happens, you have to review it, make sure it's accurate. Um, there might be reasons why you need to speak to the legal team, it might be you might be in a regulated industry, or there might be compliance issues, or privacy, or security that you have to worry about. Um, you have to talk to the marketing team, how are we going to tell this story, how are we going to bring people into the product? And what's our launch messaging? Are there blog posts? Are there social media? Are we doing any press? Do I have to speak about this? Do I have to go and do public speaking um, at industry events? That sort of thing. So you can probably tell, as a product manager, you're basically doing a little bit of everything. Because um, you are that single point of contract for the product, both inside the company and out. You're the person who is most strongly associated with it. Um, and you end up working with all these different teams. And although you work with all these different teams, you are not in any of those teams. And so you, you develop a bit of skill in all these areas, but you're not really an expert in any of them. Um, but you do, you are the only person who has the complete picture over everything that's, that's going on. So the thing worth stressing actually is you manage products, you don't manage people. Despite the fact you've got all this responsibility to make this thing great, whatever it is, you don't, you don't actually have a team that reports to you. You don't actually manage individuals from an organization perspective. Um, you just manage that product. And so everything you do is driven by influence, essentially. You have to build trust and confidence amongst your peers that you know what you're doing and that things going in the right direction and it's helping the business. Uh, and then once you've built that, you, know, you can coordinate them and, uh, and get them to help you. So understandably, like communication skills are critical, right? They're a fundamental part of the, the role. Press that device, let's go. Right. 
So uh, this is a, a, a quote I'm fond of from a guy called Ken Norton, who's a kind of highly respected product manager who works now at Google Ventures, who are venture capital investment arm of Google. And they, um, his role at that organization is to provide essentially product advice to act as a mentor to all the companies that they've invested in. And he's got this great um, article he wrote quite a long time ago, but it's still very well known, uh, called Bring the Donuts, which is about how he goes about finding product managers and about the role of product managers. One of the things he says in there is, remember friend, nobody asks you to show up. And what this means uh, is that Product management is kind of weird because it's not actually essential. Like it's not a, if you took the product managers out of an organization, that organization wouldn't collapse. Like if you took the developers out, nothing would get built. If you took finance people out, nobody would get paid. But product managers, the company would just continue ticking on. But over time, it would start to struggle. Like it would become quite bureaucratic because this, the communication would start to break down internally. They'd, they'd lose a sense of potentially a sense of direction. There wouldn't be anybody kind of strongly representing the users in there. Um, a lot of that coordination burden would end up falling on the engineers. And engineers generally are much more productive when they're not interrupted rather than when they are. Um, so essentially it's a facilitating function that greases the wheels of the organization. Um, but it's not essential. So I've been going on and on about this role and how you know, you've got all this responsibility and there's all this great stuff. And you might be wondering, if product managers are so important, why haven't I heard of any of them? Um, and the chances are you probably have, you just don't realize that they uh, were product managers or are product managers. And there are quite a few people who've come up through product management and then gone into to, to success elsewhere. So there's a few names. This guy called Brett Taylor. Um, he was the product manager, the original product manager for Google Maps. Um, and uh, after doing Google Maps, he left Google, started a company called FriendFeed. FriendFeed was acquired by Facebook. He became chief technology officer at Facebook. And then after that, he left and founded another company called Quip, who were creating online document collaboration tools. And you tend to find that happens a lot. Product managers tend to be quite ambitious people, and often they develop this wide set of skills, and they get frustrated being just part of this machine, and they go off and do their own thing. This is Stephanie Hammond. Uh, she was, uh, again, a Google, she was a product manager on, um, originally she was the product manager who proposed Gmail for organizations outside of Google. So, essentially you know, universities, businesses, that sort of thing. She then went on to, to uh, Google Wave, then she left and went to Facebook and did risk and, risk and trust, which sounds terrifying on Facebook. And then she came back, did YouTube, and then last year, she was made Chief Technology Officer of Hillary Clinton's election campaign, and was recently listed as the fourth most politically influential person in technology by Wired Magazine. Marissa, who you probably have heard of, so Marissa was uh, ran product at Google for about 11 years before she left to become CEO of Yahoo. She's also very significant because she founded Google's Associate Product Management Program, which is their graduate hiring and, and training program for product managers, which sort of set the template for all the, the, the graduates' training schemes to follow. There's a lot of really interesting articles out there. If you search for Google APM program, you find all sorts of interesting articles about this program, which is a two-year program where they rotate you for a number of teams, they take you on a a world tour, literally. Um, and she ran that program personally right up until she left. And now she started a, a very, very similar program at Google. Sorry, at Yahoo. Sundar. So, Sundar uh, was product manager for Chrome, the original product manager for Chrome, uh, when that launched. Uh, and that went quite well. And so then they gave him apps. And that went quite well. So then they gave him Android. And that went well, quite well. So they made him CEO of Google. So he's done. All right, so we've talked a bit about what product management is um, and what it involves, and hopefully by this point you begin to get a sense of whether this sounds really interesting or really terrifying. Um, because there's no doubt product management isn't for everybody, it's a certain character type, and so let's sort of dig into whether um, it might be for you. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the traits you see in product management. Uh, incidentally, I'm not suggesting that every product manager exhibits everything on this list. Um, but like, if you recognize um, yourself in some of these things, then it might be a good fit. Okay, so, first and first, first, product managers are, it's a leadership role. And I don't mean that, as I said, in the, in the managing people sense. I mean in the um, showing people the way sense, right? You set the direction um, for people to follow around that product. So that comes with a certain, you know, a certain set of skills. Obviously, you need to be pretty confident. You need to inspire people. Um, decision making is essential. Right? The, it's very easy to get stuck trying to make the perfect decision, the right decision, trying to 
get all the data and, 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 and nail it. But often it's just better just to make a decision, even if it's the wrong one, learn quickly that it's the wrong one, correct yourself and move on. That sort of constant course correction is kind of an essential skill because momentum is critical. Um, you also have to be quite tenacious, like things go wrong and you have to be able to just stick with it. And you have to be quite resilient because you have to make, you have to be comfortable making unpopular decisions. Because the best decision for a product might not be the decision that your engineering team likes or that your marketing team likes or that your users like. Sometimes the best thing to do is to kill something completely. And that can make you really unpopular. So if you're the sort of person who loves, who needs to be loved, it might not be something that you enjoy. Um, communicate, I already mentioned that you know, communication is essential. Um, you need to be able to articulate your direction, your vision. Um, people you need to be able to persuade people um, that uh, the direction you're going in is the right one. But you also need to be able to listen, listen to those users, listen to the people around you, and, and empathize with users, particularly people who are dissimilar to yourselves. There's a, a well-known um, tendency in Silicon Valley in particular for companies to build products that are really only of interest to people in Silicon Valley, because they don't empathize with the broader US or the broader world. Empathy is also very important inside companies. Right? When you're doing relationship building, you need to be able to empathize with the people around you and understand what do they care about, what constraints are they operating under, what incentives are, are driving them, what pressures are they feeling, and in order to sort of manage those relationships. Energy. So the product manager kind of drives the team. They are the person who sets the mood for the team. You tend to find that that everybody around the product manager is kind of very highly attuned to their emotional state. If the product manager starts to look down, and everybody kind of comes down with them. And so it's important just to be able to stay positive, even in the face of setbacks. Um, it's also important that you, know, you just like working with people, and you love what you do, and you're passionate about technology, and you believe in the power of, of technology um, to do good things. So you've got to be a bit practical. I mentioned about you know, kind of being detail-oriented, caring about the little things that make it great. Um, but you have to balance that with some pragmatism because you can't do everything. And sometimes you just have to say, well, let's ship it. Because nothing you build has any value until it ships. So sometimes you just have to say, this will do. Um, you'll be organized. There's a project management element to the role. Like you're managing the schedule, you're managing the people, you're handling dependencies. You've got to be able to kind of juggle all those things. And then, you know, when it's coming down to the wire and everybody's watching and you're going to make it and you've got some event coming up, you need to be able to just knuckle down and get on with it and not buckle under pressure. There's a creative side to it as well. Uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to see opportunities to make the product better. You have to recognize opportunities for new products, things that, um, ways of solving existing problems creatively or new problems that haven't yet been solved. It's also useful if you have a good eye for design, you recognize what a good product looks like, you sort of see the beauty and simplicity in everyday things. Um, there's sort of an analytical side to this, which is kind of the counterbalance to the creative side. And you can see a lot of these things seem strangely contradictory in some respects. Um, because often, as I mentioned, you can't just win, right? You can't just say, well, you know, I think it looks better that way, so let's just do that. You have to be a bit data driven. You have to actually go out there and collect data. And we run a lot of, of uh, what things called A-B tests, which is where you say, I wonder, I hypothesize that this product might perform better if it behaved in this way, but I don't know for sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build that behavior, but then I'm going to split my user base down the middle, and half of them will get the old behavior, and half of them will get the new behavior, and we'll see which one performs better. And that's kind of a really fundamental, iterative process you use to do continual refinement uh, on, on product design. You also have to be informed in the sense that you have to care about the industry you're in, you have to care about the space you're in, you have to know what the competitors are doing, you have to know what new trends are in the industry, what new technology is coming up that will enable you to do interesting new things with your product. Uh, not, uh, yeah, and then sort of questioning. So essentially, uh, there's, a, there's an element of curiosity to this. You tend to find that the product managers, they look at the world and they sort of ask the question, why are things the way they are? Like once you start having to make those kind of product decisions about what, the way things should work, you start wondering why other things work the way they work. Um, what factors went into that? Um, you have to be open-minded in the sense that you could very well be wrong, right? In fact, often you are wrong. And it's important to be able to say, actually, I was completely wrong. I'm going to change my mind here and go do something else. And you have to do that in such a way that people see that as a sign of strength rather than of weakness. Um, I was kind of on the fence about the word opinionated because it's got negative connotations, and that's not really what I mean, but I can't find a better word. What I mean is you have to be the sort of person who forms and expresses opinions, right? Like you have to have an opinion about um, you know, subjects that come up, about direction, about strategy, about the business. Um, you have to be willing to actually voice them. 
um, you have to be reasonably assertive about uh, about your opinions. That doesn't mean being you know, arrogant or unpleasant or rude. You just have to be willing to speak up. Um, and then you have to balance that with with humility. Uh, you know, I mentioned a minute ago, you might be wrong. You might have to change your mind. Um, it's important that you you know you, when things go wrong, you take the blame, and when they go well, you give others the credit. Um, you know, it's important that you, you recognise value in the ideas and opinions of people other than yourself. And that you're constantly collecting feedback and, and suggestions from all around you and kind of distilling them down and synthesising them into you know, the, the best, most impactful things you could be doing at that moment. It's important that you don't mind getting your hands dirty, you don't mind doing just what needs to be done to get the thing out the door, even if that's really you know, demeaning or, or trivial. Um, the reason why Ken Norton's article is called Bring the Donuts is because he argues in there that sometimes the job of product manager when you're right down to the wire and you've got you know, a release that's due and everybody's working late, it's just to go out and get donuts. So I realize that's a pretty long and potentially intimidating list of character traits. Um, and as I say, I'm not expecting people um, to have all of those things. And indeed, most product managers don't have all those things when you start. But if you look at that and think, that's sort of set of skills I'd like to evolve, then product manager is a good place to do that. And you will develop those skills. Um, and actually, uh, that's, that sort of brings me to an interesting point. I'm going to take kind of a weird aside for a moment because we're about halfway through. Um, what I've seen when I've been recruiting, both at Google and now, is a tendency for some people to be reluctant to apply for roles unless they feel like they meet every single criteria listed in the job spec. And I just want to say, uh, as a piece of advice, if you're indulgent for a moment, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> Never apply for a job where you already meet all of the requirements. Because what are you going to learn, right? Like if you want to increase your value, if you want to grow yourself personally and professionally and progress through your career, you have to be continually involving and growing. And the only way you do that is by learning new things. If you already know everything they're asking you to do, you're going to be bored out of your mind. And then you're going to leave, which isn't good for them or you. Right? So when you look at a job, it's not about can I do everything they're asking for. It's like, can I do enough of these things to kind of get by? And believe me, you'll be really surprised at what you can achieve when you're, when you're kind of thrown in the deep end. There's a um, kind of well-known, well-discussed phenomenon amongst kind of successful people, in quotes, called imposter syndrome. And this is the sense that um, you secretly, you, you kind of believe internally that you're not at all qualified for what you're doing, that you're a complete imposter, and at any minute now someone's going to realise, uh, and uh, you're in trouble. And a certain amount of that is healthy and normal, and actually good. Um, too much, and you know, you're crushed under your own self-doubt. So don't go there. But don't worry if you feel a little bit that way, because in truth, you should always feel a little bit uncomfortable in what you're doing. Um, because then you're learning, then you're, you're developing new things. If you get to the point where you feel comfortable, you're like, ah, I know I can do this, this is, I've got this now, it's time to move on. Okay, so that was my small rant. Uh, back to the topic at hand. So we talked a bit about, are you right for product management? But equally, if not more so important, is, is product management right for you? Um, and I just want to cover some of the reasons why I enjoy it, some of the reasons why I like it, um, you know, why I feel it delivers on my goals, it makes me happy, it, uh, it, you know, I find it fulfilling. So firstly, autonomy. Um, as you can probably tell, as a product manager, it's, it's kind of up to you to figure out what to do with your product. You have a lot of autonomy to set the direction um, and, uh, and to, to set priority. So, I mentioned that when I was uh, younger, I came up through engineering roles at, uh, at, at Sun and other, other places. Uh, and, but I also mentioned I wasn't a computer scientist. I did physics, and so I wasn't. I was never a, a kind of a hardcore coder. I didn't have the uh, the theoretical background. So I was doing more support roles. I was doing a lot of help fixing stuff. And support is a great place to learn stuff. But at the end of the day, everything you've done has no real value the following day. All you've done is fix things that are broken, and everybody kind of says thank you very much, hangs up the phone, and moves on with their lives. The good thing about product management and product development in general is that you're creating something. Like you're doing something that leaves a mark on the world. Um, one of the products I managed for a long time when I was at Google was called the Google Maps API, which is Google's technology stack for allowing third parties to utilize Google Maps in their own products. And if you've ever used a website that has a Google Map on it and it's not a Google site, it could be right move, it could be a travel site, um, or if you use an app that has a Google Map in it and it's not a Google app, then you're using the Google Maps API. Um, and every day I woke up feeling like I was doing something that mattered, which is just a great feeling. And it's not necessarily that common, because this product is used, yes, it's used in retail, and yes, it's used in travel. It's also used 
by humanitarian organisations. It's also used by environmental organisations. It's also used for organisations that are supporting regime change in oppressive you know, countries. Um, every day, new use cases would come across my desk that just made me feel like, this is good. I think we're doing something good here. And that's a really, really wonderful feeling. So you've probably figured out that you learn a lot. And a lot of what you learn is actually quite valuable. In fact, product management in general is an increasingly in-demand skill. One of the reasons why I struggled a bit to hire, I think, last year, was because it's not that well established in the UK right now. It's growing. I went to sort of the big product management conference in London last year, and it was about 1,500 people. Um, but uh, it's not that well established compared to, say, the US. But within the technology sector, it's very, very well understood. This is an important role when the companies need product managers. And generally, you find companies need them when they get to about 30 people, something like that. Up to that point, it's the founder, it's a couple of engineers, they're just making it work. But eventually, the CEO or the founders starting to think more about financing and some of the more you know, uh, administrative aspects of running a business, and they need to hand off kind of that day-to-day -day management of the product, and that's when they bring the product team in. Also, you do see a few product managers who start in product management, and they get really attached to one aspect of it, and then essentially go off on a career tangent. Perhaps you really enjoy the marketing piece, perhaps you, you know, have a secret desire to be an engineer, or whatever that happens quite a bit as well. Uh, you work with lots of interesting people, that's sort of a given. Um, you've got that perspective on the big picture. That mattered a lot to me. Um, you know, I kind of, because I'm naturally kind of curious, it wasn't enough for me to just be told to go and build this or support that. Like, I need to know why. Like, why are we doing this? Why? Uh, does this make sense? Is this worthwhile? What's the, uh, what are the goals here? Um, I'll come to this in a second, but there's a surprising sort of, it, there's a lot of different directions you can go in, so it's, it's good from that perspective. Um, it's very varied, every day is different, uh, and it's a lot of fun, actually. I mean, especially when you get, you, you actually ship something, you get something out, and you see, see people start to use it, it's really, you know, it's really a lot of fun. Okay, so I mentioned this a moment ago, where, where can you go from here? Um, so, product managers exist both in large and small companies. Um, again, this is a relatively new role, you tend to find it's the kind of the bigger but newer companies, so Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Microsoft, these kind of companies, they will have product managers or an equivalent. Um, and then most of the startups will get to a point where they need them uh, and they're hiring for them as well. Um, so you can go in, you know, in either of those directions. There's travel opportunities, as I mentioned, so it's a sought after um, role, so it's quite easy. Um, but let me give you an example. At Google, every six months, every product manager in the company gets an email that says, Do you have any interest in moving overseas? And if you say yes, they say, which countries would you like to go to? And you say, I would like to go to Singapore. And they start emailing you product management jobs in Singapore. Because they believe strongly that cross-pollination of ideas between geographies is extremely valuable from a product perspective. But because it's a global company, they need people to build products that work anywhere. So you can't just have a bunch of Americans working on products in America and a bunch of Brits working in London. And that was how it was so easy for me to go from London to Sydney and then Sydney to San Francisco. I could have just easily come back to London, but I decided, Maybe I should try something new. Um, so certainly a lot of travel. Also, you tend to find that because product management is that um, single point of contact for the product, if you're working on something significant or important to the business, and that business is based somewhere else, you spend a lot of time going somewhere else. Uh, one year in Sydney, I did seven round trips to San Francisco, which is 14 hours each way. <laughs> um, so uh, I had a lot of frequent flight points. <laughs> And as I mentioned, a lot of product managers go and start their own company. In fact, um, uh, Marissa sort of famously said in an interview once that uh, for any given associate product manager cohort of Google, she expected only half of them to still be there in a couple of, a couple of years' time. Because by definition, you know, these, these are the kind of people who aspire to run their own company. If you do that, you perhaps don't have that great idea right now. Product management gives you exposure to all the different aspects of the business, which is a really great place to kind of get the grounding, the foundation stuff you need to do that. Okay. Let's get down to the numbers. How much you get paid? Uh, so this is uh, this is based on a survey. Admittedly, it's a little bit old. It was done in 2013, but I've updated it based on inflation. Um, it's still the best numbers that I've, I've found. Um, these are median numbers, so you wouldn't expect actually to go in on this salary, but uh, you perhaps spend you know three or four years here, and then you know, kind of work your way up. I mean, you can see, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty good tra trajectory. It's um, certainly a, a valuable role. And also, this is UK salaries. In the US, uh, particularly in the Bay Area, you get paid a lot more. 
but also your cost of living is also significantly higher, so it, it can kind of forecast out of the wash. Okay, so that's why you might want to become a product manager. Now, how would you go about doing it if you're interested in doing it? So I mentioned that you know many of the uh, big technology companies have actual graduate training programs for product managers, so specific processes by which they find people like you, bring them in, and then train them up. Um, Google, I'm surprised to find, doesn't actually have a dedicated website for the APM program, but they do have a student uh, website. Facebook has something called the Rotational Product Management Program, which is specifically for, for graduates. Um, and again, they, they cycle you through a number of teams, and potentially a few of your offices, uh, and get you started. Um, Yahoo, so Marissa took the APM program to Yahoo when, when she went there, so they have a similar thing. Um, Microsoft, uh, a little bit different, so you got to be a bit careful with Microsoft because the role product manager at Microsoft is not what we're talking about, it's more marketing led. They have a role called a program manager, which is much more similar to product managers elsewhere. So if you're looking at Microsoft, look for program manager. I also, I, should, I feel obliged to mention that I did look at Amazon and I couldn't find an equivalent program, so I didn't put it on the slide, but I will I'll be chasing them later to find out if they have anything similar. I, I know that I had product managers from Amazon apply for jobs that I listed, so I know they exist. But I'm not sure whether they have a training program. Um, but if you don't want to go the big company route, you want to go the small company route, um, here's a, a few places I would look for roles of smaller companies at startups and so forth. Um, working startups is a funny site because it looks like something out of like the late 90s, early 2000s, but actually it has a lot of good uh, good um, positions on there, and we had quite a bit of success recruiting from that side. Uh, AngelList is kind of the, 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 sort of the techies, like the hot, trendy place to go and find jobs, if you like. Um, so <coughs> that's also a good place to list. I was a bit hesitant about putting LinkedIn on here, because LinkedIn is a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's, it's got everybody on it, it's got everything on it, it's kind of hard to use. Um, the one thing I would say about LinkedIn is it makes it almost too easy to apply for jobs. Um, you can just go, yeah, that sounds interesting, I'll have that one and that one and that one. Um, and so, as a recruiter, I can tell you that you get tons of applicants off of LinkedIn, but very few of them are actually good quality applicants. So if you find jobs on LinkedIn and you think you're interesting, then make a bit more of an effort to stand out from the crowd. Find out who's, you know, try and figure out who's recruiting, maybe connect to them on LinkedIn, send them a personal message. Just do something that says, you know, I want this job, I'm not just applying for anything. Uh, Mind the Products are an organisation that, uh, that organise product management events in the UK uh, and abroad now as well. Um, a really good bunch of people. And uh, they've started a little jobs board. It's not that active yet, but I think it's growing. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you should craft an application based on my experience of receiving them. Some of this advice actually extends to other roles as well. Um, but uh, I thought it might be useful to give you kind of the perspective from the other side of the fence. Um, so CVs, I'm not going to tell you how to write a CV, there are a million people who can do that. Um, the one disadvantage that you, you have as a, as a group is that most of the, the usual stuff, you know, uh, your educational background and so forth, um, is very, very similar from one candidate to the next. There's really not much there that tells me anything useful. So what I care about when looking at CV is do you have any relevant skills, any relevant experience? Uh, and you might say, well obviously I don't, haven't done product management by this point, but if you look, think back to that list of, of traits, do you have anything that kind of demonstrates those kind of traits? Have you organized events? Have you spoken at, at uh, meetups? Have you, um, you know, uh, done charity runs? Like anything that just says, I am someone who does stuff, right? Um, who, who gets stuff done, who is passionate and, and enthusiastic. Cover letters, you would be horrified at how bad, in general, cover letters are. It's shocking. Um, so first and foremost, before anything else, just make sure that it has reasonable written English. <laughs> like, I could not believe how much bad English I got. And you might say, well, that, you know, that's a bit petty, but the problem is that you know, as a, someone who's hiring product managers, I'm looking for someone who's gonna come in and review documentation and draft copy for emails, communicate with partners, you know, even just like specify what the label should be on the buttons. Like I need to know that they can do that without me having to copy check everything that they're doing. So I took a zero tolerance approach to bad English. Get someone to proofread it if necessary. And personal bugbear, don't use ampersand symbols in the middle of pro sentences. Thank you. Um, uh, don't make it too long. I got some of them massive, like essays. Um, keep it succinct, keep it eloquent. Um, don't just reiterate your CV. What I mean by that is I got a lot of letters that said, 
I, you know, I'm good for this job because I've, done, I've studied this here, blah, 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 and it was just cut and pasted essentially from the CV. What I really want to know when I look at the cover letter is why are you right for this role, right? And why is this role right for you? And tell me something about who you are, about your motivations, about um, you know, why you're enthusiastic about this. And obviously it's a given that what I'm saying is it should be a tailored <coughs> thing. Don't just create a form cover letter and send it to everybody. Like, I want people who care enough about this job to have actually put some effort into the point. Um, this is kind of obvious, I, I, won't, I won't dwell on it, but essentially, since you start applying for jobs, you now have a professional identity online as well as a personal identity. So think about that. I'm not the sort of person, personally, that goes and checks your Facebook history. Some people do, but I think that's a bit unfair. But there are some things which are clearly kind of quasi-professional in nature that you should be conscious of. So I will go and check your LinkedIn profile. I, I was really surprised when I was looking for a job a year or so ago how LinkedIn is just the only tool that recruiters use. And so make sure you have a LinkedIn profile, make sure it's up to date, make sure it matches your CV. So that surprisingly, uh, that, that didn't, wasn't always the case. Um, you know, if you've got a website, great. Uh, I mean, I would say that the last few things on there are not about me looking for reasons not to interview you. Actually, they help your case. If you've got a website, it looks good, it's got some interesting content on it, um, or if you've you know, written articles, or if you've spoken at events and their videos online, this is all good. Um, you know, uh, the more the better, basically. Okay, so let's assume that you, you send me an application, or you send me an application, and uh, it's promising, so we're going to set up interviews. What sort of interviews might you get if you want to be a product manager? This is kind of a, a very, very simplistic list of the kinds of topics that will be covered. Um, if you go to a product manager interview, of, certainly at the bigger technology companies that have a very structured process. So, for example, at Google, um, these days they do a phone screen, at least one, maybe two, and then they'll do uh, at least one product interview, one analytic interview, one technical interview, uh, and then one more kind of across the board senior level interview. Each of those are about 45 minutes, something like that. So I'm going to talk about these in a, in, in a bit more detail. I'm going to go, go, go into kind of some tips on how to get through an interview of that type. Before I do that, some general tips. Again, probably not product manager specific, but just worth mentioning. Um, firstly, like, don't panic. <laughs> don't be afraid of dead air. Just when you get asked questions, just take a breath and think about them before you get stuck in. Um, ask lots of clarifying questions, right? Um, generally speaking, if you're interviewing somewhere good, somewhere <coughs> that kind of respects their employees and wants you to have a good experience, they're not actually trying to trip you up. Um, but it is often the case that they want to see whether you explore the space of the question. Are you actually um, just taking it at face value, or are you digging a little deeper to understand what they're, what they're getting at, what they're looking for? I'll give you some examples in a minute. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, don't be afraid to say, can I have a moment to think about it? That's absolutely fine. Um, be careful about jumping to conclusions or assuming making assumptions about the question or about the context. So check your assumptions, run them class the interviewer. Um, which also mentioned, relates to something else on the slide, which is have a conversation, right? Don't just Give an answer, sit back, and shut up. Like, have a engage the interviewer because they're not just trying to find out whether you're um, uh, whether you know certain things or whether you can do certain things. They're trying to figure out whether they want to work with you. Right? Are you going to be interesting uh, to work with? Are you going to actually spur good, constructive conversations? Um, read the interview. What I mean by that is is every interview is a little bit different. Some of them are better than others, um, but try and pick up. Do they want more detail? Have you, are you beginning to run on a bit too long? Are you going in the right direction? Um, like, just try and be tuned in to, to the interview and how they're reacting and, and how they're trying to steer you. Um, using the whiteboard may seem really specific and petty, but it's a general rule. Like someone who comes in and just sits there at the desk the whole time and just answers questions is not as good as a candidate as someone who stands up, grabs a marker, and, and gets stuck into the whiteboard. Like, think out loud. Show your workings, as they used to say at school. Um, do it up, up, up on the board. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, we're not actually trying to trick you up. We're actually trying to give you an opportunity to demonstrate what you can do. So take those opportunities. If we, if we throw you a bone, like grab it and run with it. And show, show your strengths. OK, so let's, let's talk a little bit about some example, uh, the sort of things you might want to see in a, in a, you might get in a product interview. So product instinct interviews are about your Appreciation for products in general. Do you recognize a good one from a bad one? Um, can you think about how you might go about designing or developing some pro product to solve a particular problem? 
Um, and you might get some softball questions at first, like suggest a product you've been particularly impressed by and tell why. Um, but then you'll probably get stuck into something a bit more concrete. And this is an example of a question I was actually asked in my product management conversion interview when I applied to be a product manager at Google um, yeah, back then. Um, and so, it obviously there's a wide variety of different types of, of, of these questions you could be asked, but a few basic guidelines is, the best candidates are the ones that start with the user, right? So, if I were to say to you, design me an app uh, to uh, help me find gluten-free bakeries in uh, my, my nearby town, some candidates will just go straight into, well, I have a map here, I have a list of places, and then we'll have some reviews, and yada, 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 yada. But the best candidates step back and say, so, what do you need? When will you be there? Why are you not being served by existing tools? Let me understand you as a person, and then we'll figure out how to solve these problems. So start from the user, empathize with their needs, figure out whether there are any, um, any constraints around the problem that you should be aware of that haven't been explicitly specified. Again, that's kind of about exploring the space. And then lay out the requirements. In other words, say, okay, these are the problems we're gonna try and solve here, before you then go and try and solve them. Um, and solve as simply as possible. All I mean by that is, I'm not, I'm not impressed by these elaborate, overly complicated solutions. I'm impressed by the simplest, quickest solution possible. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, when I say and select one if needed, sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation where you're being asked a question where there are potentially multiple audiences that your this service, whatever it is, could cater to. Specify them and then pick one. Right? Like don't try and do an answer that serves everybody at once. Just say, okay, and for the purposes of this answer, I'm going to focus on this audience and then go from there. Okay, design sense. There are a bunch of different ways of doing this, but a very common approach is just for the company concerned, and I've done this, to take a particular page on their website or a particular part of their app, stick it in front of you and say, tell me, tell me what's wrong with it, tell me how you can make it better. Um, so the important thing in that situation is to look at what they've given you and take a moment to figure out what is this, what is I'm looking at, what is it for, what is it, behaviors is it trying to facilitate for the users. And also, you know, I said or encourage there. What I mean by that is, what is the business goal behind this? Like, what are the business want me as a user of this service to be doing here? Um, again, what constraints did it design down under? What I mean by that is, um, find out when was, it, when was it built? And why was it built this way in the first place? You know, if you look at, for example, one part of our website, um, you'll see that there's a list, there's a list of all, all the um, different companies that you can invest in on, on Crowdcube. Um, and each, each item takes up like a third of the screen. And if you've got a lot of companies listed, it's really, really long. And you might think, well, that's a bit strange. Like, why is it this massive long list? Well, it's because when it was built, the company was far younger, far smaller, and we only had like four or five companies on the platform at any one time, so we need to make them take up space. They couldn't just be little boxes in the corner. But times have changed, we've moved on. Like, now it's not fit for purpose anymore. So taking that example, taking that question of, what was it like then and what is it now? Also, what would it, like, what would it be like in, in, in another few years' time? Plan ahead. Um, and then at the bottom, what should be removed? So this is so simple, but so often overlooked. There's often an assumption by candidates that when they get these problems, that everything on the page is sacred. That they can't possibly take anything away. Right? And therefore, they have to just design things that just tighten things up, move things around. Like, no. like. Think about, is any of this stuff useful? Is it actually used? Like, do we need it? Like, would the product be better if we actually tore it out? That's impressive. If someone says that to me, it's like, this is pointless, you should get rid of that. I'm like, well done, you're absolutely right. Okay, analytical skills. Um, this is kind of a bit of a weird grab bag, but essentially it's about your ability to take problems and break them down. Like your, your, your problem solving methodology, if you like. Uh, and often you'll get what are called Fermi estimation questions. This is the basic idea that um, I will ask you a question, I'll ask you to estimate something uh, when you have no data available to help you do it. Right? Stuff that you could just look up on the internet most of the time, but the problem is more about how you go about solving that. And it turns out most of them are more than doable if you just step back and think about it a little bit and start figuring out you know, um, what are the different factors that will influence this. So, so to take this, this example, you might come at this from the, sort of the demand side, like how many people are likely to be going to the cinema, um, and how many cinemas will um, you know, what, what they need. Or you might do it from the supply side, which is like, uh, how many um, people uh, need, what's the, what are the necessary occupancy rates of the cinema in order for them to stay in business? Um, so that kind of, you know, both of those are perfectly valid approaches, and you know, they should give you approximately similar answers. The, the 
The task here is not to get the right answer. And you, sh you are likely not going to be judged based on whether your answer was closer or further away than the next person. It's about the approach. It's about how you break it down. So the thing to do here is to be very, very explicit about that. Don't do stuff in your head at all. Just say, this is the, what, the way I'm going to go about it. And write like a pseudo equation on the board that says, I'm going to figure out this, and then I'm going to multiply by that, and I'm going to divide it by that, and I'm going to add this. And then you know, break those things down. Do we know those things? Until you get to a point where it's like, OK, I'm going to estimate this based on what limited data I have. The fact that I know that there are 65 million people in the UK, or, you know, or something like that. And at the end, just like double check. Uh, I once, so there's a, uh, I was training someone actually. Uh, I was giving them interview training for a product management role. And so we were doing a few of these questions. And one question I asked, which you will never get asked in the interview because it's been discussed to death on the internet. And that's why it's good for training because I knew it wouldn't come up. Um, was, uh, we were, I was in the US at the time. And the question is, estimate how many planes are in the air over the US right now. Um, and you know, he went through this model and he came up with, uh, how many did he come up with? He came up with, no, sorry, not how many people. How many people are in the air? Um, and he came up with an estimate of 100 million. And I said, think about that for a moment. And he said, is it a bit high? I said, how many people live in the US? He said, 300 million. He said, so you're telling me one in three people are in the air right now? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just like double check your work. OK, technical skills. Um, so technical skills is a little tough because it really depends on the interviewer. And I know that sounds a bit of a cop-out, but um, most of the large technology companies will have an engineer interview you. And if they've been well-trained, they'll know that the task of an, an engineering interview for a product manager is not to grow your algorithms and, and, you know, and CS theory. Um, so what, what they should do, and hopefully by now most of them do, is ask you questions that test your ability to communicate with them as an engineer. Because that's the core skill of a product manager when it comes to working with engineers is do you, are you able to maintain a high bandwidth conversation with an engineer about technical topics? Um, so essentially, you know, they might ask you how to troubleshoot something, they might ask you how you would design something. I, I sometimes ask people to tell me what the technical challenges would be of rolling out seatback entertainment on a, on a in-city train, right? And so, um, you know, you can talk about buffering, you can talk about whether you want to Put the content on the train. You want to talk about whether you want to stream it. If you stream it, what challenges you're going to have? You know, various other things like that. But the, the point is, can you, you know, do you have enough of a, a, a technical sense to have these conversations? Um, it used to be, until very recently, that Google and a couple of other companies would only hire CS graduates into product management roles. Um, and fortunately, everybody's now realised that, that was a stupid idea because that like a diversity of different skills and opinions is actually hugely valuable for a team. And so the strategy around these technical questions has changed a little bit. Um, but one thing I would say is, do your homework beforehand. Like, figure out what this company is, what technology they use, and what they therefore might ask you about. Like, if you go to Crowdcube right now, you'll figure out quite quickly that we're a pretty web-centric company. We don't have a big mobile app yet. Um, so we're, we're a web-based platform. So you know, it's likely you're going to get questions that are more focused on web-related technologies in you know, tech with us. OK, strategy. Last one. Um, so this is really about, you know, uh, can you uh, come up with a business strategy around a product? Like, can you figure out how to make it as successful as a business? Um, and so, you know, often someone will take a, a well-known product like Facebook Messenger, which doesn't necessarily have an obvious monetization strategy, and ask you to figure out what that might be, or figure out the opportunities are. Um, and the thing to do here is, firstly, identify where the value lies in the product. So, and what I mean by that is not the value to the company, but the perceived value outside the company. Where do people recognize that value to be? Is it in the service they're providing? Is it in algorithms and technology that's been developed in the infrastructure? Is it in data that you've accumulated? Is it in the audience that that technology gives access to? And I'm sure there are other categories as well. Figure out where that value is, because that's what people will pay for, right? And so that's what you need to identify. Um, I once asked someone to come up with alternative monetization models for Wikipedia. And what you tend to find when you ask that question is some candidates will just go straight to ads because it's kind of easy, easy and obvious, but it has some clear downsides in terms of, uh, sort of editorial independence. Um, but one candidate, the best, the best response I've got, like what you tend to find then is, is candidates do better tend to be the ones that focus more on the data that Wikipedia has, like how would you syndicate it, how do you license it. But one candidate said, actually, the most interesting data that Wikipedia has is not the data in the articles themselves, it's the usage information based on the usage patterns of their users. 
it's the information they have about what people are reading and when they're reading it. Right? So um, they're talking about the ability to track up and coming news stories, or you know, trends, or weather, or things like that. Um, that was a really interesting answer, and we, we had a long conversation about that. Um, so also, don't get hung up on one approach. Like, like Scattershot just come up with a bunch of different approaches, let the interviewer decide if they want to explore any of them in, in detail. Um, and also, be conscious of the, show some awareness of uh, what, where this product relates to the broader strategy of the company. So for Facebook Messenger, you know, their, their goal as a company is to connect the world. Um, and so, you know, if you come up with a strategy, if you propose a strategy that was explicitly in conflict with the core business, that's, that's not so great. Okay. So, I've talked a lot about interviews, um, and we're almost done, I promise. Um, so, practice. There's this great site called thepminterview.com. It just fires a random product manager interview question at you and finds out what you ask for. Um, it's actually a really, a really good site. It's put together by, uh, by someone who, who built it for themselves, actually, uh, to help them practice. And it will also give you a better sense of the sorts of questions that you might get. Um, okay. So I just want to say something um, that I think is really important because I know in your situation where you're graduating, you're, you're trying to find a job, um, you know, you want financial independence and all the rest of it, that um, you feel like, you, you might feel like it's just about finding something, right? Uh, it's about being selected. But actually it's as much about you selecting the company as it's about the company selecting you. Uh, and this is really, really important because companies will try and and, and lure you in with promises of all sorts of great things. It could be free food, it could be uh, you know, gym vouchers, it could be table football, it could be on-site massage, whatever. Um, uh, and that's all very well and good, but ultimately, you will be at your desk or something equivalent to it, eight hours a day, five days a week, 48 weeks of the year, whatever. Um, and there's only three things that will actually make the difference between whether you enjoy this job or not. And it's not the free food, and it's not the massages, and so forth. It's just, are you working with people you like? Do you enjoy the work you're doing? And is the company culture positive? In other words, do you know, is a, a culture that where people are respected, where um, you know, people are well treated? And so those are the three things you need to get to the bottom of when you're considering whether to work for a company. Um, and the interviews are your opportunity to do that. So while they're asking you questions, you should also be judging them on do they seem like good people? Have they treated you well? Does it seem like a good environment? What, am I, what work am I going to be doing? Does that sound interesting and fun? Because that's, that's the stuff that actually will matter to you on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so um, this is a bit of a cop-out, actually. Um, this is the website I'm putting together to go with this presentation. This website does not actually exist yet. I'm sorry, I didn't manage to finish it. But <laughs> if you give it a few days, then hopefully a copy of this presentation uh, and a whole bunch of supporting information about um, uh, articles you might want to read, books you might want to buy, uh, other videos you can watch. I'll, I've got it all stacked up. I just need to publish it on the site. And that is that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.